right. So we'll start and say good. It feels like the afternoon still um, with daylight saving. So um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to GP Update for tonight. And I just wanted to um, acknowledge the land in which we're meeting this evening, uh, the Ghana land here where I am, but also to acknowledge the land where you may be meeting this evening and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So we, this was a bit of a, a rushed, organised webinar for tonight, but really thought it was very important to get everyone together to sort of talk through where we're at with our COVID-19 response here in South Australia and ensure that you had the latest information uh, from our experts in the field in terms of where we're up to with the, the Parafield cluster, but also uh, with general practice and ensuring that our practices are safe, uh, particularly um, as, we are, as part of this cluster currently. Uh, so I'd like to first of all thank um, all the collaboration in this space with the RACGP, myself being um, a Deputy Chair of the State Faculty and the AMA, unfortunately Chris Moyers, an apology tonight. And I'd like to also thank SA Pathology, Dr Tom Dodd, who's uh, very kindly giving up some, his time this evening as Clinical Services Director and Professor Katina Denaise uh, from Wellbeing SA and also from the Department for Health and Wellbeing as Executive Director for, for COVID Systems. So what we'll do first of all is um, I'll just um, hand over first of all to Katina to talk through where we're up to here in uh, South Australia. And I've just put this graph here first of all to show the national of where we're at from a national perspective. And then I've put on here then our daily cases here in SA. And Katina, you can see that little blip that went up in November for that time period. And now we're sort of just got those cases sort of bubbling along. And I know our GPs and clinicians, practice nurses would all really appreciate a bit of an update of where things are at um, with the with the Parafield cluster, but also really what can we sort of expect from a community perspective? And I know you're very busy, Katina, so thank you for giving up um, some time this evening. Thanks, Emily. Oh, I'll take this off, otherwise people can't hear. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, Okay, so obviously you would have heard about the cluster um, and we are up to 29 people now as part of the cluster. So really the issue that we've got in front of us is while we've been pretty quick off the mark and, and um, know where the next cases are coming from effectively, we still think that this is a significantly risky cluster for us. Um, parts of the kind of outbreak have been contained, uh, but there are other parts that really are just not um, at this stage. Sorry, um, that door does knock and open a lot. Um, so where I think we have our greatest risk going forward uh, stems from the Woodville Pizza Bar. Um, and that is primarily because um, you know, it's an open sort of space, people coming in and out all the time. And it's not possible actually to track 100% of people who have been to the pizza bar who, or have eaten the pizza. Um, we also know that because we've got a, a reasonably large number of cases that they've been to various places across the city. Um, those places are obviously on the SA Health website so people can have a look at them. And while the risk, you know, for example, of walking through a supermarket alongside a COVID case is small, if 100,000 people go into places that are incredibly small risk across the city, you'd have to expect that you're going to get one or two cases from it. So it's more about your very low risk, but you put enough people through that low risk, you might actually get a case. Um, so we are absolutely, I mean, I know we, we spoke about this last time, about the need for testing, but now the need for testing is incredibly serious for the state. Um, I would say that that north and west of the city at this point in time is the very most important place for even the mildest or even unusual symptoms that can't be explained um, to be for testing. Um, but as the over the next couple of weeks, you know, that geographic boundary might change and it might in fact be the city. Now we'll actually only know if it's spread outside of our outbreak zone by people getting tested. Um, we also think that there will be some people obviously who won't present to a GP and aren't interested in being tested, but their family members might present to a GP and they might themselves be interested in being tested. 
um, I guess I would encourage, if you can, um, speaking with people um, who you know are part of a community that is less likely to participate in the health sector, less likely to visit a GP, less likely to get tested, and you're with their family, you know, I guess that sort of encouragement that anyone unwell does present. Um, the only way we're going to be able to stop this is by picking up cases as they pop up, but really quickly. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, I guess a case popping up in three or four weeks time will mean that we've had multiple generations and we've kind of lost the outbreak. So um, that's where we are, I guess, really, it's just that, um, and we know, we know we are getting a lot of testing across the state, record numbers, but it's got to be the right people tested. Not, not not asymptomatic people. It's asymptomatic if you're part of our outbreak, yes, but otherwise we're really looking for symptomatic individuals to be tested. So I don't know if there are any questions before I um, continue. Thanks, Katina. Look, we've had a few questions come in before the webinar, of the, uh, yep. particularly areas people were interested in. And um, the, the first area really was in around um, mask usage in particular, and whether you had any specific advice around mask usage within practices and, and then also uh, within the actual clinical setting as well. Yeah, look, I think that um, it's reasonable for people to be using the surgical mask. I mean, as you saw, we, we're doing that even in here um, because we've, we've got a large number of people and we're trying to reduce the risk of transmission. It's important to remember that source control is, is actually quite effective. So anybody, or frankly, anybody who's got respiratory symptoms should not be sitting in a waiting room. Um, I mean, that's obvious, but, but even wherever they are, they should be offered a mask and put that on as well as to clean their hands or sanitise. Um, I do think we sometimes forget the source control and really just think about what, what we need to do. But I would suggest that that is a reasonable thing to do in this climate, especially if you're in that zone where we know we may have undetected community transmission. Thanks, Katina. And general advice still for the community around mask usage. The other question was around cloth mask usage as well. Oh, OK. So, I mean, not everybody has access to resources. That means they can always wear a mask. Um, there is evidence that mask use does slow the spread from, you know, within a community. Um, it's obviously not a perfect solution. And if you misuse and people kind of touching their face after having a contaminated mask, it's obviously a problem. Um, but I think that it's warranted where we have the risk of, of community transmission. It, we know it slows down the spread and really that's that's what we're keen to do. We've put it out as, as for people to consider it and not as a requirement, understanding that making it a requirement can, can be tricky for people. But most certainly people who are vulnerable to infection, I, I would be recommending to all of those patients uh, that they wear masks in public. And certainly on crowded places like a bus um, or anywhere where they're not going to... So I guess if you're just going for a walk on the beach and you, you expect to be separate from most people, that's a different scenario. But anywhere where you expect to be in close contact with others, a mask is recommended. Thanks, Katina. And of course, changing it as well every, every four, four hours. hours as well. I know there'd been a bit of confusion around that as well and trying to get that message out to, to patients as well about how important it is to change the mask regularly. Uh, we've had another question come through around should patients wait outside in cars as much as possible prior to coming in for their GP appointments? Yes, if that would be, I, I think yes. Um, if we have a case that goes into a general practice and sits in a waiting room with people, whether or not they're spaced out, we will quarantine the entire waiting room. Um, and that's because we are in a, we're in a situation where we're trying to, to do a very broad net of who could possibly be exposed. Um, and that's so that we can stop this outbreak and not have to end up in a statewide lockdown for a prolonged period of time. I mean, really, that's our goal, stop the transmission as quickly as we can. Um, yes, it does disrupt people, but it's far less disruptive than having to shut down the state for a Victorian style um, surge. So I would most certainly recommend that anything that practices can do that doesn't allow people to sit in, a, in proximity to each other in the same room um, would be a good idea. 
Yeah, thank you, Katina. And then uh, on that as well, there's another question that's come back in around, should every patient coming into a practice wear a mask? Is that what you'd suggest when they come into the front desk that they're given a mask? Oh, look, I'm not, no, I don't know that that's, we well, definitely can't do that with children um, under 12 as a starter. Um, I think most certainly um, anyone with unusual symptoms. I mean, if someone's just coming in and they're perfectly well, um, you know, it's pretty hard to justify the use of masks in that setting. Um, but I think the real issue is about separating people out so that you don't have people gathering. I mean, the real risk, of course, is the asymptomatic transmission or the pre-symptomatic more often. Um, a judgment does need to be made and it may be that the practice just decides that it's best just for everybody to wear a mask. Um, you'll, you have to make a decision based on, on how you're set up and how you're structured. But um, if you come face to face with, you know, that, that's why I think it's important for doctors to be particularly careful with their um, practices and hand hygiene um, when seeing people uh, who are unwell. Thank you. And then we've had a question come through around car parks. So if you're testing someone in your car park, so you've gone out to their car and you've done the swab and you've worn PPE, is there a need then for the practice to quarantine as well? No. If you've worn appropriate PPE to do a swab and it's out in the car park, you will not be in quarantine. Fabulous. That was a very clear response. Thank you, Katina. So I think that's a good encouragement for people to still think about how we were back in April, May, when we were doing a lot of car park consultation type swabbing. Full PPE is the way to go for that and then doing correct uh, doffing afterwards. Now, the other one we've had to come back in, Katina, is around cloth masks. Are they okay? I think people just want a little bit more clarification, Look, if that's all right. I think, I think they are for the general public, but I don't think it's appropriate for medical people to be using a cloth mask. I think that we should really be using surgical masks. Um, and that's because the cloth mask, um, you know, there's, there's evidence that it's, that it's not as bad as we thought it was, but it's probably not as good as a proper surgical mask. So I think there's a difference between what you might do in the general public when you're out and about, a cloth, cloth mask is fine and it needs to be washed. But if you're in a cloth mask all day, it will become less effective as time goes on. Fantastic, thank you. So we'll move now on to um, Tom to give us a bit of an update. We'll give you a little break, Katina, so I don't keep firing so many questions at you and you get a break. And um, we'll move over to you, Tom, around really where things are up to from a testing point of view. We've had a, a question come in around genomics as well, interested in that space. So we'd love to hear what's been happening with our testing numbers uh, here in South Australia and what's your key messages uh, for everyone here in the state. Yes. Uh, thank you, Emily, and good evening to everyone. So, um, as I'm sure everyone's well aware, um, testing rates were very high at the beginning of the um, last week um, and then peaked uh, around Saturday where the state did um, a, a little over 19,000 tests in one day, which was a tremendous combined effort between the three um, laboratories, SA Pathology, ClinPath and ACL. Um, I think um, there's probably a number of reasons, but um, the lockdown, of course, finished at midnight on um, Saturday night and uh, numbers have come back down relatively steep or precipitously down to under 10,000. So um, I think um, I just had a look uh, with around 9,500 um, uh, yesterday. So obviously we need to continue to encourage everyone who possibly should be having a test uh, to get tested. The laboratories certainly have the capacity. SA Pathology um, pushed through 12,500 tests on one, uh, one day, and we've maintained turnaround times very consistently. There's sort of been no deterioration. So the, the labs now really do have the resources and capability to push through these very large numbers of tests. Um, and so we just need to encourage people to come out and get tested. And as Katina's emphasised, uh, the next week's really critical that we have everyone that should be tested, tested. Um, so uh, it's gonna be difficult probably when we've got 40 degree temperatures coming up to encourage people to come out. Um, lots of the drive-throughs will be working kind of split shifts. They'll be opening very early in the morning and then um, having a little bit of time during that 
really hot part of the day when they'll be closed, and they'll reopen again in the evening. So there will be plenty of opportunities for people to get tested. Um, in terms of genomics, the um, SA pathology, um, microbiology, genomics, uh, scientific and pathology team have worked um, extremely hard in the last week and they've now completed uh, a sequencing of 22 uh, cases uh, and there's a further three um, coming through in the next 24 hours or so. Um, and as probably many of you be aware, the um, genetic sequence, the whole genome sequence for each of these cases has been identical. So it's clearly um, uh, a mono um, uh, phylogenetic uh, 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 virus strain indicating that the cluster is in fact um, can be pinpointed back really to the original um, uh, traveller who came to us as I understand it from the UK. So that of course has been very helpful I should imagine for Katina's team in, in mapping how this is um, uh, been uh, transmitted. Uh, obviously, there's some, been some concerns about one of the Eddie hotels as well. Thanks, Tom. I remember you gave us a, an excellent discuss, talk around this as well, and I think um, in one of your um, and one of your um, clinical microbiologists also gave us an update as well, I think back in July around um, genomics and how long it was taking to get the result back. I think it was five days at that time was, or seven days was where you're at, but you've obviously got it down to a much shorter period of time now, which makes it incredibly useful from a, from a tracing perspective. Yes, that's right. So they've optimised their technique and uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, really quite incredible. I can do the, the whole sequence in just uh, two or three days now, which has been very helpful. Um, we've been sharing all our data nationally and internationally as well. So that's been, um, all those sequences have now been uploaded onto the international COVID um, database. So obviously there's been a, a significant amount of interest in, in the genetics of the, um, of the strain in South Australia. It's actually probably um, one of the more common circulating viruses around the world. Um, and it's not really surprising. It's a very prevalent in the UK and, and it's not this this particular genetic um, variant isn't isn't um, it isn't all surprising that we that's what we've got circulating here in Adelaide out of a traveler back from the UK. Thanks Tom we've had a question around turnaround times how long before the test results are available to the GP but also available to the individual as well if you could give us an update on that. Yeah so the, the labs have been doing very very well um, it's important to note at the very peak, um, the private labs have made use of their national networks, which has been very important. It was always part of our surge capacity plan. Um, in terms of SA pathology, um, we're turning the vast majority of our work around in just over 24 hours. Some work, depending on the time of the day, is coming through in less time than that. We had a, a, um, some work turned through, turned out in, in under 12 hours actually and we did um, the uh, staff from the Peppers Hotel last night uh, in about three hours. Um, so typically for your patients you'll get results back in that 24 to 30 hour mark and it's ir ir really irrespective of the volume now we've got a very organised system. Thanks, Tom. And it's been similar numbers as well for the for the private setting as well, as you, as you said, which is fantastic that we've had such quick results here in South Australia, particularly when we've got up to so many thousands, thousands of tests a day. And I know you haven't stopped, Tom. Uh, you've been working exceptionally hard to bring us all of those results. Um, now, we had a, another question here around um, repeat swabbing as well and uh, whether you should be repeat swabbing and retesting individuals if, say, it's been a week since you've um, had a test and your symptoms haven't gone away. Um, I know the previous advice that it was, we have given if the clinical picture has changed to re-swab. Um, Katina or Tom, do you have any additional advice you'd like to add to that as well? I'd probably leave it, Katina. The only observation I'd make is a lot of people were swabbed very early last week and um, if, um, if their contact was only a day or two before, they, 
it's very likely that they would not have um, converted to positive. So I think a lot of people are going to need to have their swabs repeated, and that and that's a good thing. And I think, Tom, this leads in probably to what we're going to discuss as well, Katina, around the additional swabs that have been undertaken as well for quarantining time and, and in, that, in that isolation, if you're happy to talk through sure. the rationale of, of, of the, the swabbing interval as well. Yeah. Look, I completely agree with Tom. Um, we, I mean, and perhaps perhaps the best way to describe it is to go through how we've, we've approached it this time. Because we've had the opportunity of being at the front of this rather than catching up, we, we have got, we have had lots of people in quarantine who had a test on arrival into quarantine, so on the day, um, who've tested negative. Um, we then repeated for most of them uh, three days later, three to four days later, um, and that's where we've picked up our subsequent positives. So. Um, the serial interval is, it has been quite short for most people, but not all actually. We've had a couple that have pushed more out to the eight to 10 day mark. Um, and so we, we, for example, tested them on the first day, we've tested them three or four days later, they're still negative. We test them three or four days after that, they're now positive. So that's obviously people who are part of the cluster. Um, and so that's really just to let you know that we've done this deliberately because what we're aiming to do is identify cases as early as possible and before they're symptomatic so that we can make sure all the public health action is in place. So our routine of going day two and day 12 testing really only fits that kind of traditional hotel quarantine for people coming from international arrivals. It doesn't fit an outbreak scenario. Otherwise, we would not find out about all of, you know, get a big hit of cases on day 12 um, and, you know, missed too many days of public health action. So that, that is why we've changed it. I would say as well, we, there was an example of a, of a fellow in New South Wales who uh, got tested for COVID, tested negative, over the next couple of days was still unwell, um, attributed his symptoms of being unwell to being something else because he'd already tested negative. A few days after that, I don't know how it came to be, but he got tested and he was positive. So. Um, it was lucky that he was retested. He quite rightly thought, well, I've been tested, I'm negative, and he made his way around the city, um, basically exposing hundreds of people, um, when in fact, the second test was positive. So sometimes, if you've really got a high index of suspicion, um, so for example, for us at the moment, if a person lives in a household where every other member is positive for COVID, they've got symptoms, but they've tested negative, our stance is, well, that's a false negative. Um, and we treat that person as if they're infectious because especially when they're children, we found we've we found an unusual scenario where we get children testing negative when we're expecting them to be positive. So I think everyone needs to keep that in mind that clinical suspicion is important. No test is perfect. Um, and we don't really understand how it works with children very well. And so I would suggest that people keep that high index of suspicion. And if you really think it's still something, then I would get tested again. Thank you, Katina. Uh, now we've had a question around how long before we can expect to have widespread rapid testing available. Tom, are you able to make a comment on the rapid testing? So I think the important thing to understand about rapid testing um, is that it's not scalable. So these are, we talk, I think um, we're talking about the antigen testing. So they are um, 15 minute tests, but they have to be done individually what we are able to do with the PCR testing, of course, is to put through large volumes um, in this sort of scalable fashion. So we can put through tens of thousands of tests a day. Every individual um, antigen test has to be done one at a time, swabbed, put on, run, interpreted 15 minutes later. We, you know, it would take one person uh, doing that about, uh, they might be able to do 10 an hour. So, um, There'll be clearly a place for this. Uh, we're rapid, we are promptly developing, um, uh, making the test available here uh, in South Australia. We think we'll have the capacity to have an antigen test available here within the next two to three weeks. And it'll then need to be thought through very carefully how we use it. The other thing is the sensitivity and specificity um, is not as great um, as the PCR test. So, so whilst it will be useful, it, it certainly won't be the answer for um, wholesale um, screening of the population. 
Thank you, Tom. Well, that's great to see that's really coming along and it's not very far away at all. But as I said, we need to be very conscious of the sensitivity. Um, look, I will just ask another question that's come through around viral respiratory PCR tests. So if a GP orders the viral respiratory panel, uh, Tom, what's the chances that they'll get that reported and it will come back? Are you still offering that as an option for people to order or are we just focusing now on COVID? Yeah, so um, as people would appreciate, um, it's the same scientists, laboratory um, equipment and um, reagents that are used for COVID as, as other um, molecular testing for organisms. So during the absolute surge peak, uh, we pause doing uh, respiratory viral panel testing for um, the community. In fact, even in the hospitals and the same for enteric samples. We're bringing that back online. Um, but right at the moment, we have said we will not do full respiratory viral panels for community cases or enterics um, this week. Um, so we're really just focusing on um, COVID. We want to get those tests available as soon as possible. Um, um, just so you, people can appreciate, one of the consumables that's really critical are the pipetting tips. Um, for COVID, use one tip effectively per specimen. For RVP, for respiratory panels, we use six. And if you're doing um, 10,000 a day, uh, suddenly becomes um, 60,000. You run through these consumables that all get, man they get manufactured uh, internationally. So we we're just being um, cautious around that, but we should have those um, full range of RVP panels and enteric testing back online for the, the whole community uh, next week. Thanks, Tom. We've had a question asked around pooled tests now and around um, how does that work with widespread community testing using pooled tests and then individual testing if a particular batch then tests positive? Yeah, so it's actually a very good question. Um, we have worked up the capacity for pooling. Um, you would not want to use pooling except if you were really hitting your capacity constraints in the laboratory. There's loss of sensitivity with pooling. The other thing is once you get very large uh, widespread community transmission, the effectiveness of pooling actually drops down because uh, you, you would potentially get a lot of your pooled samples positive, then you've got to go back and run them all again. So at the moment, we are uh, not in a position where we would need to go to pooling um, it was certainly important in Victoria where they were doing very vast numbers, um, but there are shortcomings because the sensitivity drops off. So we, we won't go down that path unless we really need to because of volume. And we, we you know, we cut through nearly 20,000 in a day without, without an issue. So um, if that had to be sustained for a long period, we might go down that path. Thanks, Tom. And I've got one more question for you, so you're not in the firing line for too long. Uh, are COVID serology tests able to be ordered here in SA for people with very suspicious previous exposure? And how might someone go about ordering that? Yep, so there is um, serology available. What we've said um, to this point is that for community practitioners to order serology, they we want them to get approval from the CDCB from Katina's team. Um, my observation at the moment is Katina's team are very, very busy. And so it's a question of the timing and the indication for the test. Um, certainly it's available, but um, if it's a historic in infection, maybe maybe we'll just wait till we've got this uh, cluster back, broke back in. Thanks, Tom. And certainly you've been doing quite a lot of serology testing for us anyway, in terms of uh, looking at um, back around the, the cases and then the contacts and looking for previous exposures. So you've, you've certainly been keeping up your serology test numbers in the lab, that's for certain. Now, Katina, I'll move back to you if that's all right. I'll give Tom a rest so I'm not asking so many questions in the and, um, and give him his voice a rest. Now, how much sewage testing is happening in Adelaide is a question that's come through, Katina. And I think it would be really helpful as well for the GPs, clinicians, practice nurses, everyone online to sort of hear a little bit about what's the basis for doing this sewage testing and what is it really telling us? Okay. 
So we do have multiple sites for sewage testing across the city. This has been going since for, for, for many months, actually. Um, the testing isn't done by Tom's lab. It's done by um, an environmental testing lab um, at SA Water. So we there's still a bit to be learned about sewage testing. We aren't completely sure what happens with regards to shedding in the faeces of the virus. Um, we're not completely sure how long that happens after resolution of infection or infectiousness perhaps, um, but it would seem that people shed in the stool for at least a few weeks after any um, infection is over, um, but possibly for longer. We don't know, for example, the impact of immunocompromise and other, and other factors, the usual sorts of factors that might change the way that shedding occurs or shedding by different age groups. Um, but it is the case that the virus is definitely shed in the stool and can be picked up in sewerage. Um, now, the testing uh, platforms that are being used are uh, new and being developed um, and validated as they go. There has been a lot of progress in that, but it, we're still not precisely clear what the sensitivity and specificity of the test is. So from our perspective, we think the important part about wastewater testing is really in the scenario where you really think you don't have anything going on at all in the population, but now you're getting some strong signals that are repeated um, that show us that there may well be positive cases. Um, of course, when we have a situation like we're in now, the catchment area for big parts of Metro Adelaide coming positive is actually not going to really change what we're doing. It's more for where we don't think transmission is occurring uh, and we have a positive. And really the, the steps from there is about really letting the community know uh, that we, we have potential case or cases in the mix um, and really to alert people to, to get tested if unwell. Thanks, Katina. I think that's very helpful for people to understand. I, I know I heard um, Dr. David Cunliffe on the radio this morning as I was driving into work and I thought, gosh, I'm sure people will have more questions around what the science and the evidence basis is for this. So thank you. Now, Tom, I've got a question back for you now in terms of, uh, of self-collecting swabs. So we've had a question come in. Uh, can GPs swab themselves for COVID? As I was told by a nurse at SA Path that there are COVID testing center a few months ago that I could not test myself. It's not allowed here in SA. The queue was very long and the nurse I knew was a GP, knew that she was a GP, but said, no, unfortunately can't be tested. Tom, what's your advice around the self-collected swabs? I know we've seen that in other states that they are doing some self-collected swabs, but, but what are your thoughts on that, Tom, and the evidence behind it? So I think um, we've been very um, reluctant to encourage people to do self-collected swabs. There's, issues with adequacy of the collection and um, risk of contamination of the um, viral transport medium um, container, plastic bag and so forth. However, of course, if colleagues are swabbing themselves, it's probably a different matter. Um, people know that they've got a decent swab from their nose um, and uh, if they're careful, uh, it's, it's not not a completely unreasonable thing to do. As a you know, you're taking a swab from yourself. I I don't think that's so much an issue. What I was concerned about were were people taking you know the patients taking their own swabs if if they weren't well supervised. Um, it's much better for someone else to take the swab. But if you want to take your own and send it in, that's, I don't think there's a big issue with that. Thanks, Tom. So hopefully that's answered the question. And then, of course, saliva testing, Tom. And, and, and now there's all this new talk around buccal testing as well and leaving the swab in the mouth for a, for a couple of minutes instead of, um, instead of doing the nasal swab, particularly whether that's an option in children. Is that something that SA Pathology is giving some more thought to or has there been any further developments in that space? Yeah, once again, it's, it's partly around the sensitivity. Um, so there is some data and there is definitely some loss of sensitivity um, for the testing. So um, the one thing that we would find challenging, of course, would be um, saliva specimens, of course, would then come in pots. And then that would be a major 
um, step in handling them in the laboratory. So in terms of laboratory workflow, and it would, would apply to each and every laboratory, particularly when we're doing peak workloads, we receive saliva in pots. Of course, that's got to be then um, transferred into the viral transport medium to start the um, laboratory process. So we certainly, from a workflow perspective, don't want to see lots and lots of saliva samples in that way. Um, we know that the method we're doing now with the nasal and uh, oropharyngeal swabs is highly effective and it's been, you know, we've, we've managed to deal with the pandemic here very effectively using the current method. So um, whilst we're doing the testing, sort of demonstrating the capacity to do um, saliva specimens, we're, not, we're certainly not encouraging that at the moment. And it, it certainly we wouldn't want to see that right at the moment. It would be, of course, far more difficult for us. Thanks, Tom, for that. Now, Katina, we've had a, a couple of questions come around quarantine time, and I'll read it out. We keep hearing 14 days quarantine is not enough. Has there been, oh, sorry, 14 days quarantine is enough, I should say, sorry. Have there been any cases uh, where it's been negative at day 12 and then later developed symptoms and were in fact positive past the 14 day quarantine period? If you're happy to make a comment on that around the pickup times with incubation times with quarantine. So, well, we don't have any evidence here of that having occurred. Um, and I'm certainly not aware. I mean, I, I've heard case reports where there's, you know, very prolonged incubation periods. Um, I actually think it would be pretty hard in the rest of the world for anyone to tell anything anymore about the epidemiology of the virus. It's really only places like Australia where we could watch the transmission happen, where we can look at that. Um, look, as far as I understand it, if you reach day 11, you're at the 97% plus chance that you will have become symptomatic. So we're really talking about a tail end when you get to beyond 11 days. We, we mostly, the average um, incubation period is five to six days. Um, in this outbreak, we've seen incubation periods as low as three, where you know someone exposed one day, infectious the next. So it's quite remarkable. Yeah, and so you're saying, Katina, with that as well, it's the it's around the symptoms as well. So even in that asymptomatic period beforehand, it would still be picked up on PCR testing. Yes, if they're in that infectious period before becoming symptomatic, yes, um, we we most certainly are picking up multiple asymptomatic people who become unwell a couple of days later, and they've tested positive. We can really, we're, we're getting a really strong handle on how the um, PCR results look, how serology looks, obviously with our colleagues in SA pathology supporting us, but we, you can really get a sense of where someone is in their infectious cycle and their incubation period by looking at the results. Thank you. Um, now, in terms of uh, now, you've just we've had another question come through around the incubation time being an average five to six days, and that's been the usual range that you've found, Katina, for here oh, in SA so, as well. So that's the average that we hear. Our, well, actually, it depends on which part of the outbreak we're talking about. So the thing about this um, virus is that it, you know, it it moves through human networks. So if you get a large number of people and you put them in really close together, you can get quite rapid transmission from person to person, um, which is certainly what we've seen with parts of this. Um, and yet in other parts, we're seeing that, you know, we're getting longer incubation periods and far fewer people being infected. The virus is the same for each of those individuals. It's about how much contact sick people have with everybody else. So it's about that interaction with the human network that changes how it looks. I mean, of course, there will be individual person characteristics as well, but far and away, um, where there's a large interconnected social network, there's a large and rapid transmission. And I guess the opposite is true. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good way of summarising that. Thank you. Uh, we've had a question around immigration facilities in the NT. So the NT is using staffed and resourced immigration facilities for people returning from overseas. Why not use Woomera and other facilities here to better control uh, the population and less risk for community leakage of the virus? Now, what are your comments on that, Katina, in terms of uh, quarantine facilities? So it's a really tricky this is a really tricky thing. Um, I mean, 
if we had a, a beautiful facility in the metro area that had lots of air for people and space to move around and not and stay within their own um, sphere, you know, that would be the ideal scenario. Um, I think being very far away from major hospitals would be risky. We do a lot of people um, who are COVID positive actually do need to go to hospital and we, we wouldn't want to risk their health. Um, but there is most certainly the, an issue with the need to have proper airflow um, and, uh, you know, appropriate kind of um, spacing so that we don't have too many positive cases in one small area. It's very tricky. Um, you know, if we did have a Howard Springs type beautiful facility, I don't know, down at West Beach, <laughs> that would be ideal. Um, but I guess while we don't have that, we, we're looking, we, we're trying our best really to, to adapt um, environments that weren't designed to be many hotels to be as safe as they can be. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's exactly right. And I mean, certainly the Premier announced today that we're looking at uh, reviewing our facilities and options as to where uh, people should be quarantining or people who are uh, COVID positive should be. And it'd be very difficult to be putting people somewhere like the RA, moving all our 30 um, patients there, noting the fact that we have a lot of family groups that come, people who are really vulnerable, who are, who are testing positive, it'd be incredibly traumatic to separate people into the women's and children's into the RA and then, um, and, and, then, and then be in that sort of very isolated environment rather than being in the comfort of a hotel. So it is something we'll need to be thinking about. And thankfully we have wonderful expertise from people in CDCB like Katina who can provide advice around ventilation, which in fact is when we chose our hotels, we probably didn't think a lot about at the time when we had quite low numbers coming from overseas in terms of uh, positive patients. Um, yes, and there was a comment that's now come through around, could quarantine be in a facility like Flinders? Um, and, um, oh, yes, and then we had... Hmm? Yes, yeah. well, I thought that might have been it, but we did also have the um, the the, the the holiday cabins down at Marion as well that we're using for COVID positive patients. So something we might need to think about. And then another question that's come through: Why are we um, why aren't we building purpose camps? Great deal of experience in mining camps. Why not build something in a convenient location? Yes. And Hampstead used to be set up as an infectious diseases hospital with wide open spaces. So lots of excellent I ideas. Hmm? I didn't know that. I wonder if it's got laminar flow in all the rooms. So certainly lots of thought going into that here at SA Health over the next, uh, well, certainly yeah. has been for the last week and coming up as well. Wonderful. So we've had a lot of excellent questions come through in the chat box. Uh, lots of a discussion back and forth about the mask usage. So SA Health had put out advice earlier on in the week around uh, widespread mask usage in healthcare facilities, aged care facilities, and also in uh, for public transport or where you could not socially distance 1.5 metres. And I know we've got some advice coming out for Black Friday sales uh, to be wearing masks because we couldn't delay Black Friday. Uh, that was discussed, but that was not an option. Uh, so, um, look, I think that's just really important to, you know, you've got to decide what your circumstances are in your practice and what the risk is for your patients as to whether you um, whether you ask all your patients to wear masks. But certainly the advice we're giving out for general healthcare facilities has been uh, to wear masks when people are going to interact with others um, because of that, um, because of that un, unknown risk um, potentially over the next couple of weeks. And I think that's probably something I'll just circle back to you on, Katina, around that. That, that emphasis on the next couple of weeks and what are we sort of really thinking or what are we worried about over the next few weeks as sort of take home messages for GPs? Sure, thank you. So really what we're worried about is that we, we get a generation of infection that we don't detect. I mean, even, even one, but we could get more than one. Um, you know, in a way, when when the virus the virus can kind of move very kind of quietly from person to person with very minimal symptoms, if any at all, um, and so you can end up with a couple of generations of infection in a row where nobody even knows that they're unwell, and it's usually when it hits someone who is able to spread it to a lot of people um, because of you know their family group or what have you that you get the kind of infection pop up which is effectively what's happened with this outbreak. You know, the first few generations passed kind of unnoticed um, and because people were asymptomatic, not because they were negligent and didn't get tested. 
Um, but then it kind of hit a, a family group where it was able to amplify rapidly and then we were able to pick it up. So I guess what we are worried about, and, and because we're close to the source of the, of the outbreak, we've been able to really kind of map out where it's gone. But going forward over the next two weeks, if any one of the kind of undetected areas, um, and we think, as I've said, that there could be a lot because people have been all around town, as well as this um, Woodville Pizza Bar, where we don't, we know we don't have 100% of people who went there. We, we have known unknowns. It's that part that worries us, not the people in quarantine, because, you know, that, that can be managed. Um, it's, it's our unknown people. And if we get a few generations of infection out that direction, um, we're really going to find it very hard to stop that spread. So it's really about over the next two weeks, really testing everybody, everybody who's symptomatic so that we can know um, where we're up to. And, and it could even be that we could go three or four weeks and then something will pop up. So um, this is very important, very important for the next couple of weeks, but actually for weeks to come, because you know, it, it can, we've seen in other jurisdictions, it can just pop up in the middle of nowhere. Thanks, Katina. We've had a question come through around um, N95 P2 masks that just came up, Ben, as well, around fit testing. I know we've, we've got a lot of our clinicians fit tested, particularly those who are undertaking swabbing. Uh, yes. What's your advice for GPs who are considering getting fit tested, who are, who are not already fit tested? Oh, I think that's very important. Um, we there's there's obviously debate about fit testing across Australia, but but we do think here that fit testing is an important protective factor for healthcare workers. Um, I think that you know places like Victoria, where there was a large number of transmission to healthcare workers, have um, subsequently realised that probably fit testing was a good idea. Um, Obviously, it's better to wear a mask than to not wear a mask. And so we're really just kind of increasing the um, level of protection. And this is really more an issue if you're going to be doing um, nasopharyngeal swabs, so aerosol generating procedures. It's not really just a general medical consult. Thanks, Katina. And I think I think that's exactly right. But if there are people who are who are doing a lot of that, and particularly people in I know respiratory clinics, and I will just do it, will just say thank you to all the GPs who are working in our Commonwealth funded PHN respiratory clinics. I think you're doing such a, a marvelous job in clinically assessing and then also swabbing. So thank you. Um, and, and don't forget that that resource is available to you as well um, as part of your, you know, if you're seeing patients and you're unable to swab them, then please don't forget about the respiratory clinics. I know there have been some quite long waits um, at the clinics, but I understand a lot more staff have been put on and it's, um, and it's much better now the wait times across those clinics. So please don't forget that. Um, now, the other thing I was going to mention as well uh, with the fit testing is if there is a lot of interest in that, we could look at doing that through SA Health. I know we had... Um, I know we had talked about occupational physicians who were doing the fit testing previously at different practices, but if there is an interest in that, we could certainly look at doing that through um, SA Health and organising that um, because it would be worthwhile that people are fit tested in case um, you do move into that setting and you are providing those um, repeat swabs and um, aerosolising procedures. All right, so we're almost really getting to the wards our end of the time. I'll just have a look through the questions and see what I've missed here. Um, and I will just say a couple of things as well. The PHN, they do have a contact for fit testing as well. If anyone would like to get fit tested, so call the COVID line with the Adelaide PHN. Thank you, Crystal, for posting that. And also um, you can ask their um, practice facilitator as well and they'll be able to pass on the details. So that might be an easier, quicker option than, than, than me trying to organise something here. But um, certainly that's a, an excellent way. And I will also say as well around... Um, uh, around um, the PHN and all the work that the PHN's been doing. And thank you for the PPE distribution. I know many of us are very thankful for that. I'm just gonna move out of my screen sharing here. Fabulous. 
um, and all the work that the PHN did. And, and thank you to Crystal Myers as well for setting this webinar up so very, very quickly um, so that we could get out some information to you. Because I know I've had a lot of um, emails come through my inbox and Katina was very keen to touch base with everyone as well and make sure that we're all on the same page around that need to be really suspicious. Um, if someone comes in with the slightest symptom or there's a, you know, find out a bit about, a bit more, oh, what's the background? And then also making sure that they're getting swabbed and doing all the right things with wearing a mask at the time as well. So I think I've just about covered everything. Yes, that's what I was going to say about the mask. So there's, don't forget the expression of interest as well on the PHN website. You can go to the PHN and also just want to make sure that, you know, all the healthcare providers out there and GPs out there are really taking care of themselves. We've We've seen, particularly in our Medi Hotel system, the stress it's caused um, for a lot of our staff. And now, you know, we, we're just trying to provide as much support as possible to everyone who's involved in that system for the amazing work that they've been doing. And particularly thankful to the GP assessment team uh, who have just been dedicating so many hours to that, and particularly to uh, Jenny Gould and Jenny Biggins, who have done a, a, a fantastic job as part of that team, but also to all the GPs who work for the GP assessment team uh, in the in the Medi Hotels, providing so much care to the to the travellers there. So don't forget about all the support that's out there from your colleagues, from the different organisations, the AMA, RACGP, the PHN as well. And um, Adelaide PHN has made the Kite Support app available as well, which is a free resource uh, around building resilience and support. So please feel free to um, contact Adelaide PHN as well if you'd like to um, be linked into that as well. So I think I'll leave it there because I know Katina's very busy still and Tom, you're busy still and we're all here um, it's still at work. So we'll, we'll leave it there for this evening. I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming along. Always feel free to, to email as well and um, I can pass on those emails to the relevant um, people as well. So thank you again. Thank you.